um, chat comments and questions while um, you're presenting. Um, as we continue over the next 15 to 20 minutes or so, um, please continue to post any of your questions um, in the chat function. We normally ask people to come off their mics um, in our sessions, but we have over 150 something people on the call. So um, I'll, I'll go through the questions that have come through so far. And um, one, um, David or Kim, that I personally have is around what's the resources or skills needed to implement safety to or safety differently. I think Kim, do you want to do you want to start with what you what your thoughts are? Actually, I think you should go for that one, Dave. You've written a whole PhD on it, right? So. Oh, look, I think. Um, Look, I think skills, safety safety professional, it's the hardest job in an organisation. I strongly believe that. We need to know how to work in the boardroom and how to work on the front line. We're pretty much the only support function in an organisation that cares how people do their job. Um, it means that the, the non-technical skills that we need to have in terms of building relationships and humble inquiry and coaching and having difficult conversations and and um, exploring work and all of these things is is super important to us and I, I just think that it's it's complicated, but people need to have the technical skills in safety, the ability to write a management system will get you kind of in the door, but it won't get you on the dance floor without all of the um, interpersonal and non-technical skills um, to actually build relationships and understand and influence people because safety people don't make any decisions, other people do. And if we want them to take our advice, we've got to be good people, people. Thanks for that. Um, there was a question here from David Porter um, who asked, how was the success and effectiveness of this eva activity evaluated? Uh, sorry, um, Lisa, can you please repeat the question? I'm assuming he's talking about the chat. The chat? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure which activity particularly. Um, but he asked, mean, how was the success and effectiveness of this activity evaluated? Yeah. I'm assuming you mean the chat, David. Um, so how was it? Yeah, so we are doing um, constant assurance to make sure that it has landed uh, the way in which we've intended because I think the guys could just habituate to the chat in the same way they did the written risk assessments, right? So um, it's been um, out there now for about four months. We did a verification. Obviously, they went through the chat training. Um, they did a verification of competency and now as part of our health and safety assurance framework um, we're going out there just to validate that it's working as was intended because I think there's always that risk that it could just drift right so that's what we're doing and so far so good we're monitoring it pretty closely because there was some people in the organization who are a little bit nervous about it thanks there were a couple of questions that came out related to ISO 45001 or 18001 so um, one was how much of what is being talked about is already addressed in 18,001 or 45,001. And um, there's a question from Alison around, um, would be interested to know how this fits with providing evidence, evidence, to, um, ISO evidence to court. So that may be slightly separate. Um, maybe they are, I'll have a go, Kim, if you like. Um, Look, I, I'm not an expert in 45,001 or 18,001. I've worked with them for, well, the, the original 18,001 was based on the AS4801, which was the Australian standard in uh, mid or 1996 and 98. Um, look, it's, it's as a safety management system, it, it talks about a lot of the things that we've known about for, for a long time, like um, planning and resourcing and consultation and then prescription of work and then monitoring and assurance of compliance and then um, non-conformances or, or, and, and follow up and action. They're pretty linear processes. They're pretty um, fragmented process that sit on the sideline of the business. People are gonna say, well, not if they're done properly. In my experience, they're very, very rarely um, done as they've been designed and intended to be done. Um, so I think that we need to, um, we can't conflate the standards as written and then the standards as they're put in place inside organizations because um, they're two different things. I, I would say, however, that I don't think that ISO 45001 actually treats 
um, the workforce as equal partners in safety. Um, and people will disagree about consultation, but ISO 45001 does not push organizations into genuine collaboration and deference to expertise and all of these other principles of HRO um, theory or, or resilience engineering or any of the other um, ones that we've we've mentioned today. So I think it, I think 45,001 falls short of what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think so too. We were migrating from 4801 to 45,001 um, sort of partway through our strategy. I can't say it helped an awful lot. I did use parts of 45,001 to leverage off to strengthen um, this process of what we're going through with, with safety too. Uh, I think David just asked another question to say that I think he was talking about in my previous answer, just the whole the whole change around safety too. So the way in which we've measured that, just set up some um, pre and post measures around um, trust, psychological safety, obviously safety clutter. Um, our employee engagement survey has a number of safety questions embedded into it. So there were those kind of measure, measures, serious injury frequency rate, obviously still monitoring our LTIs and first aid injuries and whatnot. So we built a strategic safety dashboard um, that complemented the strategy to measure pre and post for change uh, on the back of having um, operationalized safety too. Okay, no, thanks for that. Just going back to what David had just talked about with consultation, someone had asked a question, does Australia have h &S legislation and consultation with employees? Yeah, of course, um, of course. Um, but a, a con consultation process is, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Um, I make no commitment to do it, acting on anything that you tell me, and I'm just telling you before we do it. Um, that's, and I've consulted. And we see that with organizations with their safety cases all around the world. We see that with WHS committees in very industrial environments. Um, I know it's true in Australia, I know it's true in the UK. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think you can, I, I, yes, there's requirements for consultation, but I don't think it's um, driving the type of collaboration and frontline ownership and involvement and, um, and support that we're talking about um, with safety too. Um, Jonathan Aids um, asks a question, how does this apply to companies with third country nationals that have zero safety awareness, no matter how much advice you deliver? So, yeah, look, um, safety, safety in context is really important. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I've done work in Asia, I've done work in Africa. Um, done work on the subcontinent and there's different um, cultural context around work in, in, in many of those places, different social norms and, and, and expectations, different relationships between managers and workers and things need to fit. We see Western headquartered companies trying to manage all of those environments as if they're in the UK or Australia. Um, and I suppose I, we would never advocate for that. Um, but you need to find out where the people that you're trying to support are at and what the best way to support them to um, get their work done safely and successfully. And whatever that looks like, we're not here advocating any particular techniques. What we're here advocating is, um, is having in the forefront of your mind that people are exposed to the risk, what they're capable of and, and what support they need from the organisation to be safe and how you wrap enough around that to make sure that you can... Um, you can talk openly about safety, you know how work's happening and that the organization is supporting it to be done well. Um, so, but I think the approach I'd take to managing a, um, a production facility or a mine in, in China is different to the approach I might take in, in Australia. Yeah, no, get, which ties into um, this other question in terms of are there any prerequisites or foundations that an organization needs to have before embarking on this? For example, levels of maturity. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, um, so I think it's kind of strange. So I'll tell a, tell a quick story because that might help. I, I recently had a pool built for what it's what it's worth in at my house, um, and I, I was watching the guys do the work. Just a very small company, two or three people um, watching him for about a week. You know, dig the hole for the pool, all sorts of equipment, all sorts of safety risks, and just watching them and just understanding their work. And about a week later, they asked me what I did for work, and I said I was a safety consultant and I'd done safety for 20 years and they said oh geez you're not going to see any safety here and I said what do you mean I've been watching you for a week and I've seen a whole heap of safety um you know they just come across a really difficult rock to move they stop their work 
They had a conversation, they came up with a plan, they worked as a team, they communicated, they solved the problem, did it safely, got on with their work. They, in four months, I never saw a piece of paper. Um, they were empowered, they were engaged. The person who ran the company was there on the tools, on the shovel every day, knew exactly how the guys worked. The communication was open. They got all support they need. Um, that's what we're talking. We're trying to talk about doing that at scale in a 10,000 person organization. And so I don't, I, I think we've got to the point where we know that maturity when it comes to a culture point of view is kind of like a Western narrative that's come out of research that's kind of only been conducted in the US, Australia and the UK. And so, no, I don't believe that you need to have some sort of calculative um, maturity before you can then go and empower and engage and support your workforce to um, work better with you to manage their work and manage safety. Okay, thanks. This one, um, Kim, I think you touched on it, um, but if you wanted to add anything further, um, Marta asks, what monitoring methods do you find effective for evaluating that the non-documented processes are being done, especially in the long term? Mm, so it's a, um, obviously a key one there would be super helpful. Um, we also have a health and safety assurance framework that we've built that is based on safety two principles um, that we use to go out and verify that those things are working as they have intended to be working. Yep. Okay. No, thanks. Great. Um, have but a also, sorry, Lisa, I'd also add there, like we've got a very, um, just through our restorative culture model that we've put in place, really um, open, transparent, conversations with our field workers and they're pretty open in telling us what's not working and what is so um, we'll hear from them pretty quick as well they're not hiding stuff um, yeah they're not they're certainly um, very forthcoming to tell us if it's not hitting the mark also but that's been of about at least three years of building a significant amount of trust with the frontline workers it was different prior to that they used to hide a lot of things we didn't have that same open level of trust and transparency Thanks. Um, lots of messages still coming through. So we'll continue for another five minutes or so. But um, again, you touched on this, Kim, um, in your pre in the presentation, but I'm sure it's one on everyone's minds um, further. Do you think the reg uh, our regulators have caught up to this thinking and how do we get them on board? Yeah, it's a really great question. In Queensland, we've had a couple of meetings with our regulator. Um, and they absolutely um, thought that decluttering processes were just a huge breath of fresh air. They are also sharing some of the similar frustrations that we have. That's been really interesting. We ran a, a safety innovation roundtable with some representatives from the regulator and from Griffith University and from industry. And that was a really great conversation around how we progress innovation in safety forward, um, partnering with them. Um, there's a particular state in Australia who, again, are very progressive at that level um, with the regulator in terms of pushing um, safety to. We've got one um, in, in, the area, in that particular state, the, the head of, um, I don't know what his, his title is there, Dave Martin Campbell, but um, he's heading up the whole the regular, regular, regulatory space in South Australia. He's training all of his inspectors in the work insight methodologies and learning teams and the safety two principles. And now that's a huge step forward for us here in Australia. Obviously it's only in one state, but he's certainly not holding back in um, pairing the work they do with the safety two thinking because he can just see so much value in it from their perspective. Um, so we're certainly um, collaborating and working with them and partnering with them to share what we're doing and to get their thoughts and yeah, it's going quite well. Okay, no, thanks for that. So in Australia, um, how are you all working across like the other companies? Is there like a joint effort to, to work with the, to approach the regulators? Um, not so much. I think there's a small critical mass of people doing this work. And I think the regulators are as equally curious about a more holistic view of safety. So, um, I think they're like organizations trying to turn over rocks and see if there's opportunities for them to not walk into sites and ask for a procedure. And if the procedure's there, walk out. You know, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're trying to understand if there's more to safety than that. Um, and, and I think they're, they're learning as well. Um, I think we're seeing that in New Zealand. I just, I just might, if I can, Melissa, for a minute, just deviate a little bit to what's in the chat because 
the either end of the spectrum isn't that helpful in in safety theory this safety one or safety two and there's some misunderstandings in, in both parties but i just want to clarify at least my own personal perspective that no one in safety differently or safety two ever say don't have rules um, they say rules can be problematic because work is not fixed and static work is dynamic and this goes back to management theory in the 60s that said before we even had software and computers management theorists were saying managers can't prescribe every way that work needs to happen they need workers to adapt to the emerging situations they face or they're just not going to get their job done so workers adapt workers don't follow your rules and your procedures in your organization every day whether you think they do or they don't but what safety two and safety differently says is that organizations need to understand that it's not about shifting responsibility to the workforce to turn up to work every day and make any decision they want about how they do their job because workers don't have perfect information about what they're dealing with. They don't have the benefit of the lessons of the rest of the organization or experts. All the safety to and safety differently is saying, it's not saying throw out your rules and throw out your stuff. It's saying, understand the efficacy of what you've got in your organization. Understand how it matches the reality of the work that people do and work with your people to closer match what the way you think work happens and the way they actually do their work. And I think as Kim said, with the blue line, Sometimes the way that workers are doing their job, you absolutely have to undermine because it's drift away from what is safe. Um, you need to do that respectfully and constru constructively and equally. Some of the times that your workers are working outside of the way you want them to, it's safe. It may be more safe and it, um, and it may be more productive for you as an organization because people find easy ways to do their work. So I just wanted to hit some of those because there's a fair bit going on in the chat at, at opposite ends of the spectrum. And I don't think that's overly helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's there's lots um, on the chat. I was focusing on specific questions, but thanks for addressing that, David. One other question that came up um, was whether you find training easier or harder under safety differently. Maybe Kim? training wasn't the answer. Yeah. If it's harder or easier under safety differently, training of your of your personnel. Uh, we certainly have, just as part of our continuous improvement processes, um, revised our training approach. Um, a lot of our training was sheep dipping. It was uh, irrelevant to certain cohorts. So we've, um, you know, it was <laughs> long and boring and not engaging and didn't make, again, just didn't make a difference to the guys when they left the room and went back to doing their job. That's just poor training design, right? So we applied those same decluttering principles to... Um, training. Um, is it easier? I think so. I think because we're just taking some of the principles that are working from the theory and applying it in that training context. So yeah, I would say things have definitely improved for us. We've still got a long way to go though. Okay. Good. Um, I've, I've skimmed through, as I said, focused on the questions, lots of conversations, um, chat going on and you see this also on LinkedIn and which is why I was interested in the topic. So again, I wanna thank um, David and Kim for coming in. I don't think this is the end of it. I, in terms of uh, there'll be more conversations um, is the beauty of you know LinkedIn and having information online. But maybe David or Kim, in terms of resources, um, during your presentation, you mentioned a few. Is there one or two things you just want to say in closing where if we wanted to get more information in this um, space, so where, where to go to? Oh, look, I think you can, you can solve that with a Google search. You can go into ResearchGate or Google Scholar and look for open access papers. There's um, safetydifferently.com is, is an open blog that's been probably running for four or five years with a whole heap of stuff. Safety Differently LinkedIn group. Um, there's regular workshops hosted all around the world on safety two in practice. Um, um, so there's quite a lot of, um, of places you can go. And Melissa, I've uh, uploaded a bunch of resources that we've produced for ourselves and Urban Utilities onto our Urban Utilities website uh, that people can access to download. You know, great, thanks. And to confirm again, we will have a recording um, of this presentation as well as the presentation on our um, branch website as well as on our LinkedIn page. So um, in closing, uh, just a couple of quick administrative pieces. A reminder that we will be sending out a feedback um, form 
um, just to get some feedback on this session and um, any areas for improvement and any ideas for um, future sessions. Mm -hmm. So again, I would like to thank everyone from the Chiltern Branch Committee for helping coordinate this session. And in particular, um, David and Kim again for taking your time out to share a bit around um, safety too and the practical applications you've done at Urban Utilities. So with that, I think we can close our session today.